Brothers and sisters, good evening and welcome to our first of a four session series on St. Paul's and his letter. So I'm very, very happy to be with you tonight and again to have Father Nick with us joining and offering his wonderful, sharing his author, uh, wonderful knowledge of scriptures and in this particular case of the letters of St. Paul. So my name is Sister Angela Marie Castellani and I'm a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist and I work at the pastoral center with the Archdiocese as the coordinator for adult faith formation and catechesis. So we have this wonderful opportunity um, through uh, the great gift of technology to be able to come to many of your homes tonight and hopefully some of you are watching this together as a family or as a group of people, so you could follow up with discussions among yourselves and continue to nourish uh, your faith through the studies of scriptures. So we're happy to offer this new series after uh, the four Gospels that Father Nick Meisel has offered to us tonight. We will hear the first session, as I mentioned, on the letters of St. Paul. So as our beginning prayer, I'd like to take um, a passage from um, the scriptures from the letters of St. Paul to the Ephesians. So please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name, so that at Jesus' name every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And Almighty Father, we thank you for this great gift of being together tonight, and we pray for Father Nick and for all our attendees that God may continue to bless them and to inspire their everyday life and action. And again, tonight we have Father Nick. Father Nick was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Vancouver in, 19, in 2013. He holds a license from the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. And Father Nick currently teaches at St. Mark's College and Corpus Christi College, and also at our local seminary, Christ the King in Mission. So he is teaching our future priests and serves in parish and high school ministry. So we're very excited tonight for this first session, Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. This is an introductory session where Father will explore the remarkable life and mission of St. Paul. He will share the fascinating biography of Paul and his tumultual life in the world where he lived. So Paul is an inspiring example for all of us in our journey of discipleship. So especially after our wonderful upper room conference uh, where we hear um, and were sent out by our archbishop to be missionary disciples, how wonderful it is to hear uh, from St. Paul, one of the greatest disciples of Christ. So without further ado, please, Father Nick, um, enlighten us tonight. Great. Thank you so much, sister, and good evening. I'm so happy to be joining you. So uh, good evening to everybody. I've already seen in the chat some familiar uh, names and also some familiar parishes. So it's a real pleasure to be here with you this evening, and I'm going to dive right into my presentation. So as sister mentioned, we're going to be beginning this in this session to speak about St. Paul the Apostle. And I'm personally very happy to be speaking about St. Paul because he's someone that I've been kind of studying in my recent research and he's just a figure who's so fascinating. So I'm really looking forward to this four-part series we're gonna be doing over the course of this year. And this evening, we'll be starting to look at uh, the incredible figure of St. Paul. So I'll never forget my first visit to Rome. And probably if you've been to Rome as well, you'll remember your first time there as well. The first time I was in Rome was when I was in grade eight. There were so many things that I saw that left an impression on me when I visited Rome then the churches, the art, the scenery. One church, in, however, left it a particular impression on me, and this church was St. Paul outside the walls. If you've seen this church, maybe you've had the same impression. It's quite astounding. 
I remember being both impressed by the structure of the church, and you can see an image of the church on your screen, as well as the history surrounding this church. There is the incredible facade of the basilica with the imposing statue of St. Paul, which you can see on your screen now, central in the courtyard, holding a sword. I remember when I was there in grade eight, walking into the basilica, I remember being struck by the size of the interior of the church, which seemed so spacious and had those incredibly huge columns. I was also struck, of course, by the mosaics in this basilica of St. Paul outside the walls, especially the one in the apse and the portraits of the popes that you can find all around, just above the columns. You can see them in the image on the screen. I remember also hearing in a short tour about the history of the basilica, particularly that this magnificent basilica that can be seen today is not in fact the first structure to be built on this site to honor St. Paul. In fact, in the year 1825, there was a terrible fire that burned down the original church whose construction was begun by Constantine in the fourth century. When Leo XII called for the basilica to be rebuilt after the fire, it was decided that the basilica would be built again as close as possible to the way it was when it was originally constructed in the fourth century. Famously, many important and powerful and wealthy individuals, foreign rulers contributed to the construction of this renewed basilica. The Viceroy of Egypt donated alabaster, while the Emperor of Russia donated precious macolite and lapis lazuli to be used for the front altars. Even though the architecture of the basilica is so incredible, when I first visited the basilica in high school, what struck me most was the actual tomb of St. Paul. And this tomb of St. Paul can be found underneath the main altar of the basilica. And you can see in front of you the main altar and that cutout image is showing the tomb of St. Paul. On those occasions when I have visited the basilica since this time in high school, I've had the opportunity to pray in front of the remains of this incredible saint, this St. Paul whose life and writings we hear so much about the Mass regularly. And it's always been a very powerful moment for me to have that chance to pray in front of St. Paul's tomb. Throughout this series of four talks over the next year, I'm looking forward to exploring with you this incredible figure of St. Paul and the teachings that he has left us through his writings. This evening, in this session, we will begin by exploring the life and times of St. Paul. Now, as I go through this session, if you have any questions, please feel free just to write those questions in the Q&A function on this webinar, and we'll be happy to answer those questions at the end of the seminar. Now, those of us who visit the tomb of St. Paul today live, of course, in a very different world than St. Paul did. We arrive at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls via a tour bus or via Metro Line B. We enter the Basilica and take pictures on a smartphone that are shared around the world instantly. Even when Constantine built the original Basilica in the fourth century to honor the tomb of Paul the Apostle, Constantine's time and culture was very different from that of St. Paul. Within the New Testament as well, the writings of St. Paul stand out, since they are the earliest writings we have in the New Testament, the very earliest. Paul's letters, of course, predate the Gospels. Unlike the Gospels, Paul was writing at a time before the Temple and Jerusalem were destroyed by Titus and his Roman forces in the year 70 AD. In Paul's writings, then, we have the very first written records of someone who is working out the concrete applications of what it means to follow Christ. The antiquity of Paul's writings make them so exciting on the one hand, but on the other hand can make them a challenge to interpret. We can better understand and appreciate the writings of St. Paul when we learn more about the life that he lived and the world in which he lived. This is what we will do this evening. We're gonna begin by looking at some important questions in this session, such as this. What were the major religious and cultural influences on St. Paul? What were the important events and moments in his life that shaped him? What was the relationship between St. Paul and other Jews at his time? What was Paul's relationship to the broad greco roman world? What was his pastoral strategy? What was his understanding of the gospel and evangelization? And finally, how did Paul, who spent most of his time in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, come to be buried in Rome, in this wonderful church I've been speaking of, this Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. As we try to answer these questions this evening, 
I think that we will find that even though St. Paul lived some 2,000 years ago, his life and experiences still resonate with us today. They can inspire and direct us in our own path of discipleship. How much do we know about the life of St. Paul? Well, for someone who lived about 2,000 years ago, we actually know a lot of details about his life thanks to his letters and other New Testament texts such as the Acts of the Apostles and later church traditions. On the other hand, there are many details about Paul's life that are uncertain. For example, we're not really sure what St. Paul looked like, his physical appearance that is. Now there are some later traditions that describe him, but these are of historically questionable value. For example, there's a second century text called the Acts of Paul and Tecla that says that St. Paul was, quote, a man of small stature with a bald head and crooked legs in good state of body with eyebrows meeting and nose somewhat hooked, unquote. Other important details about Paul's life are uncertain as well. For example, while it is clear that by the time he began his ministry, he is devoted to a celibate and single life, we do not know if St. Paul was always single or whether he was a widower. Because some significant details about Paul's life are uncertain, as this session goes on, you'll hear me say things like probably or most likely and perhaps when discussing Paul's life. Although there is much we can know about his life, there is still, that is still much that is debated and uncertain. Personally, for me, this is part of the reason why I find him so fascinating. Paul's life lasted approximately 70 year 60 years. He was born roughly at the turn of the era, that is, around the year zero, and died around the year 64. Paul's life can be divided into two equal periods of time. For about 30 years of his life, Paul was a Pharisee, while for the other 30 years of his life, he was a follower of Jesus. The transition or hinge point between these two periods in his life was his conversion or his call, which we will discuss soon in more detail. According to the Acts of the Apostles, Paul was born in Tarsus, which can be found in the eastern part of modern-day Turkey. I've indicated Tarsus on the map on the screen. The ex exact date of his birth is uncertain. However, based on other details we know about his biography, his birth is estimated to be around the same time as Jesus's. Growing up in Tarsus, Paul was a member of what we can call the community of the diaspora Jews. Paul was a diaspora Jew. By this, it means that Paul was living in a community dispersed or separated from the rest of the Jews in Israel or Palestine. Diaspora Jews had unique challenges when living their faith. They had to negotiate their faith differently than their brothers and sisters living in Israel. Diaspora Jews like Paul were very much embedded in Greco-Roman society. They usually spoke Greek and read the Jewish scriptures in the Greek translation known as the Septuagint. Diaspora Jews absorbed many aspects of Greco-Roman thought and culture. This can be seen clearly, for example, in the Book of Wisdom, which was originally, originally written by a Jew in Greek and incorporates many aspects of Greek philosophy. Now, although these diaspora Jews accepted and absorbed many aspects of Greco-Roman culture and thought, they also needed to negotiate which aspects of this world, which aspects of philosophy and moral practices they could not accept. Diaspora Jews faced other challenges in living their faith. They could not readily access the temple in Jerusalem to offer sacrifice and be present for the various feasts and festivals. They needed to come to terms with the fact that they were not living in the land promised to Abraham, their ancestor. Diaspora Jews, therefore, bridged two cultures, Greco-Roman and Jewish. We clearly see this bridging phenomenon in the very names given to the apostle we're talking about this evening. This apostle, this saint, has a Greek name, Paul, and also a Jewish name, Saul. Paul reports that his parents were members of the tribe of Benjamin. From Acts, we learn that Paul was a Roman citizen. This means that Paul was per, Paul's father was perhaps able to become a citizen first by performing some good civic action, maybe donating to a public building, for example. Or Paul's father might have been a slave who was liberated by a generous fellow Jew. Paul's identity as a diaspora Jew has many similarities with our own circumstances living some 2,000 years later.
Like Paul, we also live in a world surrounded by many different ideas. Like Paul, when we look around, we probably do not find too many people who share our faith. Some certainly do, but others do not. Like Paul, living our faith requires a kind of bridging with the world. We are called to negotiate a good relationship with those around us, recognizing the good that exists in culture while distancing ourselves from other trends that do not align with our faith. At St. Paul's time, Tarsus, the city in which he was born, was a thriving cosmopolitan town, kind of like a university town. There was about 300,000 people in Tarsus when Paul was born. Now for comparison, Rome had about 1 million inhabitants at this time. So Tarsus was smaller than Rome, but still quite large. The first century geographer Strabo describes the inhabitants of Tarsus as being, and I love this, curious. There were many schools of thought, of rhetoric in Tarsus. Tarsus was an active center of Stoic thought, for example, a major current in Greek philosophy at the time of Paul. Paul's writings suggest that he was actually a product of this Hellenistic, non-Jewish education. This education left its mark on him. He probably followed the standard curriculum of his time. His letters, for example, demonstrate a great grasp of rhetoric, trained rhetoric, the art of persuasion. Paul was a masterful letter writer. His writings also show that he was familiar with some of the non-Jewish philosophical currents at the time, particularly Stoicism, which I just mentioned. For example, in Paul's treatment of marriage in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul appears to deploy and interact with Stoic categories and concepts. Part of Paul's training also involved the acquisition of a trade, specifically that of a tent maker. Paul had a trade. He worked. In his letters, we learn that Paul even continued to exercise this trade at time to times throughout his life. Even after he began his missionary activity, he worked so he wouldn't be a financial burden on the churches that he was trying to start, trying to build. The world in which Paul inhabited, of course, was dominated by the Roman Empire and by the emperor. The Roman Empire was held together by roads and the military. This created the Roman might, the Roman force. The roads and military, of course, all required taxation in order to be maintained. During Paul's time, the cult of the emperor was promoted. When you look at, for example, coins and inscriptions from this time, you find that the emperors were not only considered to be some military ruler, they were that certainly, but more than this, emperors had other claims associated with them. Emperors like Augustus, for example, were called God, Savior, Lord. The birth of an emperor was heralded as good news, euangelion, gospel. The emperor, especially Augustus, were seen to be the guarantor or the provider of peace, this Pax Romana. The peace of the empire came by and through the emperor. In the Roman Empire as well, there was a huge distinction between the elite at the top of society and the rest of the people in the empire. At the top of this hierarchical society was what we could call the 1% of the population, the emperor and the elite who had most of the wealth and most of the power. Below them in the hierarchy were the so-called retainers. Now, retainers refer to political and religious officials like priests, government bureaucrats, etc. These retainers, the second level of machinery in the empire, kept kind of bureaucracy running. Maintain retainers, priests and bureaucrats, made up perhaps 2% of the population. Below the elite and retainers was a smaller group in society consisting of the most successful, about 10%, who had some means and financial resources. Now in the empire, however, the vast majority of the population possessed little to no wealth. Approximately 50% of the Roman Empire was poor, barely able to survive, with no power to change their circumstances, living a very precarious existence. Within the Roman Empire as well, there was an abundance of slaves. The status and conditions of slaves varied greatly. On the one hand, slaves could be administrators or even physicians within a household. Some, slaves would some individuals would even sell themselves into slavery if they were in great debt. Being a slave was better than starving to death. So for some slaves, their situation was not so severe. But for other slaves, for example, galley slaves, they suffered considerably. 
Regardless of their conditions, whether it was the best for slaves could possibly have or the worst, slavery was always viewed as a difficult way of life. Although slaves were provided some protection in Roman law, they were essentially the property of their owners. Think about that. Slaves were considered property, not persons. Slaves could be liberated or redeemed, and we'll see Paul takes up this term a lot to describe what Jesus does for us, if enough money was given to their master. As we have seen, the Roman Empire mainly consisted of very few haves who controlled much of the population and wealth, and the rest were these have-nots. A system known as the patronage system ensured that a sum, at least a little wealth, trickled down to those who were without wealth and power. In this system of patronage, which Paul brings up a lot in his theology, the patron, that is the superior, gave loans, employment, or some benefaction to this inferiors. For example, the funding of some public building, this benefaction was known by the Greek term kadis, kadis, which finds its way into the New Testament and is translated as grace. So a patron, a superior, would give a grace to people below him or her. In exchange for this grace or charis, the patron received honors on the one hand, often in the form of an inscription. Now at the bottom right of your screen, you'll see a very interesting inscription that is dedicated to Pontius Pilate, and this inscription was found in Caesarea Maritima, uh, a city by the coast that Herod the Great built on the Mediterranean. And per, uh, Pontius Pilate apparently built or helped contribute to the building of some public structure and in exchange received this inscription to honor him. In addition to receiving this honor, those who received the grace or the patronage of the superior had to acknowledge his or her debt to the client his or her debt to the patron. The client then, who's in this relationship with the patron, had to show his or her superior pistis, which is translated as faith to the patron. This way of thinking, this patronage system, plays heavily in Paul's theology, and we'll see this in future talks. But basically, you have people who are superior with money and wealth, who give to those below them. This is known as charis or grace. And in response, those people who receive something need to be in this relationship of faith or pistis with their superior. Although Paul was certainly influenced by non-Jewish culture and thought, St. Paul the Apostle was thoroughly steeped in Judaism. Paul's most important source for his thought, his reflection, were of course the Jewish scriptures, which as we mentioned, he would have read in Greek, even though Paul would have known some Hebrew and Aramaic. Paul's letters are really filled to the brim with references to the Jewish scriptures, allusions and citations to them. Paul was particularly influenced by the book of Isaiah, especially the last part of the book of Isaiah, and we're going to see some examples of that shortly. As well, Paul was very fascinated by the book of Genesis, especially as we'll see later how he rereads Genesis in light of what Jesus does for us. And for myself personally, this is an area I'm investigating right now in my own research, the creative and innovative ways that Paul rereads or reinterprets the book of Genesis. Paul himself made it clear how being a Jew was central to his identity. It was something that Paul often highlighted in his letters. Take, for example, Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 onwards. Paul writes, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. This was central to Paul's identity. He was a very active and very zealous Jew. While raised in Tarsus, Acts tells us that Paul left Tarsus, perhaps with his family, and sig spent a significant portion of his formative years studying in Jerusalem. We read this in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. According to Acts, Paul trained under the great Rabbi Gamaliel. During his time in Jerusalem, Paul was exposed to various trends of thought within Judaism. It was probably in Jerusalem that Paul developed an apocalyptic view of the world. 
Now, when you read Paul's writings, you see quite clearly that he was an apocalyptic thinker. This means that like other Jews at his time, Paul saw the whole course of history as being divided into two ages or periods. Two ages or periods. We, according to Paul and thinkers at that time, were, were living in the first age. And this age was marked by trouble, persecution, suffering, and sin. The second age, however, in this apocalyptic mind view, was still to come, was still to be inaugurated by God. This age would mark a, a renewal of the world, a vindication of God's people, and a final act of God's salvation. This second age that was to come would last forever and would be inaugurated or brought into being by God's Messiah, the Hebrew word for anointed one. Paul's mindset, this apocalyptic mindset, comes across quite clearly in his writings, and we'll see that as the sessions go on. Among Jews at his time, however, this way of thinking was quite common. Of course, there were different variations. In addition, while in Jerusalem, Paul probably learned a tradition of interpreting biblical texts. Jews at Paul's time interpreted texts such as Genesis or Isaiah in a particular way. Every time and place has its own tradition, of course, different ways of interpreting the scriptures. These traditions that Paul would have encountered were developed and passed down in various loosely organized groups who wrote their texts, uh, their interpretation in some texts that can be found outside the Bible. Uh, an example of this is quite interesting is that Paul's understanding of the book of Genesis, especially the events that happen with Adam and Eve in, in paradise, are very similar to some Jewish texts that predate him. And this shows that Paul was influenced in his reading and his interpretation of Genesis by other texts that Paul read, or perhaps came in contact with the people who produced them in Jerusalem. For example, there's a collection of Jewish texts, and these are not found in the Bible, but predate Paul's own writings. And these texts are called, or these traditions are called, the life of Adam and Eve. And these texts expand upon the story of Adam and Eve that we find in Genesis chapter 2 through 3. Now, as just one example, in these texts, Satan, or the devil, becomes a prominent figure in the temptation of Adam and Eve. Now, of course, in Genesis 2 and 3, the character who deceives Adam is Adam and Eve is the snake. But later Jewish tradition throws Satan and the devil into the mix. Satan, in fact, in some of these texts from the life of Adam and Eve, is described as transforming himself into an angel in order to deceive Eve. So in these traditions that developed in Jerusalem at the time, Satan transforms himself into an angel in order to deceive Eve. Now, Paul seems to show a familiarity with this tradition. For example, he expresses this concept in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 11, verse 14, when Paul writes that Satan can, dis can disguise himself as an angel of light. And in this point, Paul in the letter is trying to warn his addressees against certain false teachers who are kind of disguising themselves as true teachers, just as Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. While in Jerusalem, therefore, Paul was steeped in particular ways and traditions of interpreting the Jewish scriptures. By learning more about these traditions that existed within Judaism, that Paul was probably or almost certainly uh, familiar with or came in contact with, when we read these texts, like Apocalypse of Moses or Jubilees, we can better appreciate Paul's own thought. Now, as we go forward in these sessions, I'm not going to spend too much time looking at these texts, but certainly I'll reference some of these texts from time to time because they really provide a fascinating light into Paul's writing and thought and helps us better interpret his thinking and his theology. While in Jerusalem, Paul would have been also exposed, and in addition to these ways of interpreting the Bible, Paul would have been exposed to more formal groups within Judaism in, at his time. We heard previously a little bit from Philippians chapter 3 that Paul identified with a certain group within Jerusalem. Paul says that he was a Pharisee. Now, among Jews at Paul's time and Jesus' time, there was, of course, significant similarities in their belief and practice. For example, obedience to the law of Moses, the Torah, was a central tenet among all Jewish people at this time. On the other hand, we need to be careful. Although there was, of course, great similarity among Jewish people when Paul was living, we need to appreciate that there was also significant diversity among Jews at Paul's time. 
According to the first century Roman Jewish historian Josephus, Josephus is a historian best known for writing what is called the Jewish War. Around the turn of the era, again around the year zero or so, Josephus says that, quote, there were three parties or sects of Jews which had held different opinions about human affairs, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, unquote. The Sadducees and Pharisees, of course, were familiar with them. They're mentioned in the gospel. The Sadducees were associated with the priesthood in the Jerusalem temple. The Sadducees seem to have been more closely allied with Rome. According to the New Testament, the Sadducees did not believe in life after death, nor in angels. Sadducees held that only the Torah was scripture. Only the law, the five books of Moses was sacred. The Essenes, on the other hand, and we do not hear the Essenes referred to in um, the New Testament, were a pious ascetical group that seems to have lived by the Dead Sea at Qumran. They were often, the Essenes are often associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. This community of Essenes seems to have cut themselves off from the temple in Jerusalem. They never accessed the temple in Jerusalem, even though it was still operational. In your screen, in the center top image, you can see the remains, and this is at Qumran by the Dead Sea, of a mikvah, which is a ritual purification pool. And this pool perhaps was used by Essenes around Paul's time. The Pharisees, this third group that Josephus refers to and, and which Paul was a part of, are often described in the gospel as being opponents of Jesus. They're kind of maligned for being very legalistic. However, we should keep in mind that among the various groups within Judaism, the Pharisees were probably most similar to Jesus' own thought. So Jesus probably had most in common. He, Jesus was not, was not a Pharisee, certainly. But Jesus had most in common with Pharisees. And because they shared enough commonality, they were actually able to argue. Now, we don't know too much about the Pharisees because they did not, it seems, leave behind any writings. Paul, in fact, appears to be the only Pharisee for whom we have writings or texts remaining. But the picture that the New Testament presents of the Pharisees tells us that the Pharisees saw the law and oral tradition, the tradition of the elders, as informing their beliefs and practice. Pharisees, unlike the Sadducees, believed in the bodily resurrection and in angels. Now, in the process of being exposed to various trends within Judaism, we see that Paul really was familiar or very sympathetic to certain trends, for example, trends of biblical interpretation. Paul associated himself with the Pharisees. So Paul was very friendly with certain trends within Judaism. But Paul eventually came in contact with a trend within Judaism that he violently opposed. This is the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. These individuals, the followers of Jesus, of course, will later become known as Christians. But we need to remember that at Paul's time, followers of Jesus were really one more trend within this movement, one more trend or movement within Judaism. Followers of Jesus were people who had come to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, the one sent by God to bring about the final work of God's salvation. Paul is clear, Paul is crystal clear in his writings that he violently persecuted this growing community of Christ followers. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, for example, we read, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. According to Galatians and Acts of the Apostles, Paul's persecution of these early Christians, this community within Judaism, was motivated by his zeal for the tradition of my fathers, Paul says, it was motivated by the tradition of my father. So Galatians 1, chapter 14. According to Paul, these early Christians, these early followers of Jesus, had betrayed what God had revealed to Paul's forebears. In his great zeal, Paul was willing to plan violence against the followers of Jesus. We see this in Acts chapter 26. Acts reports that Paul was present at Stephen's stoning and approved of it, Acts chapter 7. Like some other Jews at his time, Paul seems to have been motivated by figures found in the Old Testament who were really gripped by zeal to enact or to enforce God's law within the Jewish community. They were very zealous. 
For example, Phineas, the biblical grandson of Aaron that we read about in Numbers, the prophet Elijah, and the priest Mattathias, who was active during the Seleucid persecution. All these characters were motivated by zeal. They violently attacked their co-religionists, their fellow Jews, who they deemed were perverting their faith. So Paul, prior to his conversion or calling, really saw himself in line with these other zealous Jews. This then is the first half, the first 30 years of Paul's life. At this point, after 30 years of his life on this earth, everything changed dramatically for St. Paul. Around the year 35 AD, Paul had a transformational experience that is sometimes described as a call or a conversion. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 29, describes this experience Paul went through in narrative form, in the form of a story. Now, Paul, as we know well, was on the road to Damascus in order to persecute the followers of Jesus, and we read the following. Now, as Paul had journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. In Paul's letters, the description of his call is somewhat different. We don't hear this story on the road to Damascus, Paul having this encounter. Paul, in his own letters, doesn't get into great details about what happened, but he describes what happened in a very interesting way, a real interior um, revelation that he received. This is, for example, how Paul describes his experience in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 and onwards. For you have heard of my former ways of life, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and had called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach among the Gentiles, I did not confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia, and again I returned to Damascus. Now, without giving too many details, Paul makes it clear from what we've just heard from Galatians that the risen Lord Jesus appeared to him just as he appeared to the original apostles and believers. Paul, of course, did not know Jesus when Jesus was doing his earthly ministry. But Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, makes it clear that Jesus, the risen Christ, appeared to him in the same way that he appeared to the other earlier and more original followers of Jesus. Paul was convinced, really, that he had received a kind of divinely granted revelation. Although this experience that Paul went through is often called a conversion, we need to be a little bit careful with this term, conversion. Paul's did not understand that he was changing from one religion to another after he had this experience on the road to Damascus. And this is often how we would describe conversion today. After Paul's experience, Paul still very much understood himself as being a Jew. Paul saw himself as being a part of the Jewish people his entire life. Prior to his experience on the road to Damascus, however, Paul was living a life which was zealous. He was zealous for his faith. He was a pious Jew, as he boasts himself. But Paul, and this is really important, simply could not accept or understand how Jesus could be the Messiah. Prior to his life-transforming event, Paul lacked this gift of faith. Paul's zeal, his passion, was pointed in the wrong direction. During his transformative experience, it was as though a switch were turned on for St. Paul. The faith that he lacked to accept that Jesus was the Messiah was granted to him as a complete gift, a complete grace. Paul described this as his previous misguided zeal being corrected. In this life-changing experience, then, 
Paul came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, the one sent by God to bring in this new age of salvation. So in Paul's ex life-changing experience there on the road to Damascus, this gift of faith was given him. He kind of went from a dark room. He was not able to understand that Jesus was the Messiah into seeing literally the light, this gift of faith that Christ is Jesus, God's Messiah. Now, according to the Paul scholar Michael Gorman, as a result of the experience that St. Paul had on his way to Damascus, Paul understood the following. Paul understood a lot, kind of unpacked this experience throughout his life. But Paul could not believe these things before his conversion or his call. It was all a gift. So according to Michael Gorman, this is what St. Paul comes to understand about what God revealed to him about Jesus on his way to Damascus. Paul came to understand that Jesus Christ was no longer dead, but alive. Paul came to see that God had raised Jesus and thereby both vindicated and exalted him. Paul understood that the crucified Jesus was indeed the exalted Messiah of Israel and thereby the royal son of God and Lord. Paul came to believe that Jesus' death was not merely kind of a curse for him, something terrible. This is what Paul believed before. But Paul came to believe that Jesus' death was efficacious, that Jesus died for the sins of others, brought goodness and salvation into their life. Paul came to believe when he encountered the risen Christ that the eschatological resurrection of the dead, the resurrection at the end of the days, had already begun with Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus that occurred in the past in history will ultimately be given to all of God's people in the future. Paul believed that God's son would soon return and would take those who belonged with him to live with him forever. In the meantime, while Paul and other Christ followers await for Jesus, they're called to live a life of the highest moral and ethical standards. Paul also on the road to Damascus came to understand that Jesus could be encountered as a living person and presence. Paul's encounter with Jesus, he came to see, was an experience of undeserved mercy, total gift, total grace. During his encounter on the road to Damascus, Paul's violent zeal for the law, he came to see as being misguided, and persecuting the church was a grave error. Paul also, throughout his life, came to see how the significance of the law, the temple, and circumcision needed to be reevaluated in light of God's vindication or victory of Jesus. Paul also came to believe that Gentiles were to come to God in the last days. And this is a very important aspect of Paul's thought that I'll unpack later. Paul came to see that Gentiles must somehow become a part of God's unfolding plan that came about after the death and exaltation of Jesus Christ. After Paul's transformative experience on the way to Damascus, his life was changed forever. He went from persecuting the church to proclaiming Christ at the cost of his own persecution. In his new mission that lasts for the other 30 years of his life, Paul brought with him all his previous life experience, his influences, his talents. All of these, his past life and his upbringing, became informed by his new faith in Jesus. He began to reread his past life and the Jewish scriptures through the lens of his faith in Jesus. The same, of course, happens when we come to believe in Christ as well. When we follow Jesus, we bring our own gifts and experiences along with us. After this initial calling, this conversion on the road to Damascus, Paul, as we heard him declare himself, went on to spend approximately three years in Arabia and Damascus. We read about this in Galatians chapter 1. After this point in time, Paul, after three years in Arabia, visits Peter and James for 15 days in Jerusalem. In Galatians 1, we read, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw no other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Next, after having visited Cephas, uh, Peter, and James, Paul began his missionary work in Syria and Cilicia. This is the area I've um, um, circled on the screen in front of you. Paul remained in this area for around 10 years, between the years approximately 37 to 48 uh, AD. During his time in Syria and Cilicia, 
Paul developed his theology and honed his missionary skills and methods. It was during this time that Paul more and more understood that his mission from God that he had been given, his vocation, was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul certainly interacted with his fellow Jews, but Paul saw himself as an apostle first and foremost to the Gentiles. That's to whom his mission was sent. In the end of the book of Isaiah, especially in Isaiah chapter 66, the prophet Isaiah looks forward to a new age of redemption in which the Gentile people will come to Jerusalem and actually offer sacrifices and gifts to the God of Israel. Some of these non-Jewish Gentile people will even become priests, according to Isaiah chapter 66. The new age that Isaiah foresees is described as a new creation, Isaiah 66 verse 20, in which new heavens and new earths will be made by God. Because of their reading of Isaiah, some Jews at Paul's time foresaw a, a period in which all Gentiles would come to worship the God of Israel. Some understood that the Gentiles would come to the God of Israel, to Yahweh, and worship him while remaining, while remaining Gentiles. Paul understood that his mission was to help make this a reality, this kind of uh, prophecy of Isaiah chapter 66. E.P. Sanders, one of the great Pauline scholars of the past hundred years, describes Paul's self-understanding in this way. Sanders writes the following. Who was he? He was the one who would fulfill the expectations of the prophets and perhaps of Jesus himself. He, Paul, would bring the Gentiles to worship the God of Israel. Remember, Isaiah chapter 66 foresees a time in which Gentiles would worship the God of Israel, Yahweh, while remaining Gentiles, and they would come to Jerusalem and offer gifts at the temple. For this reason, we can understand why Paul was always so keen to get offerings and gifts from the Gentile church, as well as Gentile converts to bring with him to Jerusalem. In this way, Paul understood that in his ministry, he was fulfilling what Isaiah had promised. Through Paul's ministry, the Gentiles were literally coming to worship the God of Israel, Yahweh, and offer him gifts at the temple in Jerusalem. Based on his personal experience then of the risen Lord and his rereading of Isaiah through it, Paul came to understand that uncircumcised Gentiles cannot follow Christ without becoming Jews in the sense of being circumcised and following dietary laws. Gentiles, in other words, could receive the same promises that were given to the people of Israel way before, but without having to become Jewish people through Jesus and what he has done. After Paul's initial 10-year missionary stint in Syria and Cilicia, Paul went again to Jerusalem and gained the approval of Peter, James, and John for his mission and methods of ministering to the Gentiles. We read about this journey, or sometimes called a council in Jerusalem, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 onwards. Paul writes, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up by revelation, and I laid before them, but privately, before those who are of repute, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles lest somehow I should be running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was Greek. But because of false brethren secretly brought in, who slipped and despiled our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us to bondage, to them we did not yield submission even for a moment, that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who were reputed to be something, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who were of repute added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for the mission of the circumcised worked through me also for the Gentiles. And when they perceived the grace that was given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me Barnabas and the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they, and they to the circumcised. Only they would have us remember the poor, which very thing I was eager to do. So we see here in this passage I've read from Galatians chapter 2, 
that Paul ultimately sought and gained the approval from Cephas and the others in Jerusalem for his mission. Paul and others saw that he had been given the vocation to be apostle to the Gentiles. Now, after this meeting or council in Jerusalem, Paul entered in what could be called a flurry of missionary activity in Asia Minor and Greece between the years of 46 through 58. Paul was basically a flurry of activities during this decade or so. Now, the exact itineraries of these missionary endeavors are not explicitly described by Paul in his letters. However, in Acts of the Apostles, what appears to be three distinct missionary journeys are described. Again, these three missionary journeys of Paul are not found in his own letters, but are detailed in Acts of the Apostles. And you often find, and if you have one of those study Bibles, maps in the back that detail these missionary journeys. You can see maps of the three missionary journeys on your screen now. The first journey, you can see on the top left of the screen, is covered in Acts chapter 13 through 14. Paul, during this journey, traveled some 2,250 kilometers. The second journey, which you can see on the top right, was even longer. This is described in Acts chapter 15 through 18. During this journey, Paul covered a distance, a whopping distance of 4,500 kilometers. The third journey, the bottom right of your screen, is described in Acts chapter 19 through 21. During this time, Paul goes just slightly less than his second journey, 4,350 kilometers, give or take. Paul traveled these grueling long distances. In part, it was facilitated really by the Roman road system, which he could go on foot when he was on land, and the various shipping industries that were active in the Mediterranean during this time for his sea journeys. From Paul's letters and the Acts of the Apostles, we're able to glean many very interesting insights into Paul's missionary strategy. Some important aspects of this strategy include the following. So the following kind of are, are the ways that Paul went about his missionary activity, went about being an apostle to the Gentiles. So Paul generally targeted commercial centers found along major trade routes when he wanted to start new communities, for example, Ephesus, Thessalonica, Corinth. We'll hear about these places, read about letters written to these communities in further sessions. As mentioned, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, aimed his mission primarily at the Gentiles. Acts, of course, says that Paul did interact, went first to the Jews, but then ultimately went to preach to the Gentiles. In his writings and preaching, Paul uses urban imagery. Urban imagery. Now, compare this to the agrarian or kind of farm imagery that Jesus uses in his parables. Jesus often says, you know, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, or he confer, confer, um, the sower went out to sow. Paul doesn't use this kind of imagery. Rather, he uses urban imagery that was suited to his mission. Paul describes who Jesus is and what he did, did for us in terms of, for example, political identification, commerce, athletic competitions in 1 Corinthians 9, for example, legal proceedings Paul talks about, public festivals, and the slave trade, as we'll discuss in a moment. Paul, during his great missionary endeavors, was not a lone wolf. Paul didn't work solo on his own. Paul worked with a team, including men like Timothy and Titus and women like Phoebe. Paul worked with others. He had collaborators in his ministry. Paul, as we mentioned before, supported himself during his ministry through the practice of his trade as a tent maker. As the churches grew, he didn't want to be a burden to them. Now, although Paul was respectful of authority, he seems to work independent from human, or we could say ecclesiastical authority. He took his orders and carried out his directives from Jesus alone. And Paul makes this clear, for example, in Galatians 1, 1, and in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20. Paul took his martyr, marching orders, his directives, directly from Jesus Christ. Although Paul sought to care for the people and raise them up, Paul often compares himself to a mother caring for her children in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul could be severe, right? Paul was zealous before, and Paul was zealous after. He could be headstrong, determined. His writings can come across as quite severe, quite gruff at times. Paul also, as we know, suffered greatly during his missionary endeavors. He was oppressed, and he was persecuted. 
Perhaps the most famous or comprehensive description of his sufferings is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In verses 24 and onwards, Paul writes the following. Five times I have received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I have been shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul, as we hear in 2 Corinthians 11, suffered greatly externally. More than this, Paul seems to have suffered internally as well, some spiritual suffering that he describes as this thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, in the midst of all these sufferings, Paul maintained an incredible zeal and missionary output and activity, and this missionary output was really nurtured by his spiritual life. Paul's spiritual life was really the furnace that drove him forward, even in the midst of this persecution. Paul reports that he prayed much, Romans chapter 1. Paul explains that he had extraordinary religious experiences, such as visions. See 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul had the charism or the gift to speak in tongues. It was during this flurry of missionary activity between approximately 46 to 58 AD, when Paul wrote most of the letters that have survived and been passed down to us. During his ministry, Paul founded communities known as an ecclesia, which he cared for for a time. He spent time with them in person before moving on to start new communities. Paul really was a wandering or itinerant preacher and community builder. Paul was always in motion. Now, when Paul moved on to start a new community or visit a different one, however, he did not merely abandon his previous community for whom he had so much deep affection. Paul continued to pastor and care for all the, all the communities he had started by means of his letters. Now, the letters Paul wrote certainly have some similarities with other Greco-Roman letters of the time. The structure, the rhetoric bear some similarities, for example. On the other hand, Paul's letters are quite different from other Greco-Roman letters at the time. A significant difference was the length of Paul's letters. Paul's letters, in comparison to other letters, were very, very long. Now, the average Greco-Roman letter at this time was a mere 90 words. Another more literary letter, for example, the letter of Cicero, averaged around 300 words. The average length of Paul's letters, however, was an astounding 1,300 words, and of course, some are longer. Paul had a lot to say to the communities that he founded. Some scholars argue that in his letters, Paul actually creates a new genre of letter writings. These letters were kind of a substitute for Paul's presence in the community. They allowed him to perform what some scholars such as Gorman has called an apostleship in absentia. Paul's letters allowed him to be really present in guiding the community when he was not there. Paul's letters, with the important exception of Romans, are all responses or responding to challenges that were facing the community. Paul's letters are richly theological. However, they are always theology in a context. His message is always a response to some uh, specific issue or challenge being faced by the community. He told people what they, he thought they needed to hear then and there. For this reason, Paul's statements, when you look through his letters, don't always seem rigidly consistent, right? Because he's always responding to different challenges. We must understand the context in which he's writing. For example, Paul can be at times for and against circumcision. In Galatians, circumcision is bad. It's good in Romans. To appreciate Paul's message, therefore, we must understand the circumstances that each letter addresses. Because we only hear one side of the conversation in Paul's letter, Paul's own voice, we need to, as best as possible, try to reconstruct the situation that was being faced by the community Paul was writing to. This is what we'll be doing um, when we investigate specific writings of Paul in future sessions. What was Paul responding to? What was he arguing for or against? 
Now, within the New Testament, we find 13 letters that are attributed to St. Paul. That is, describe Paul as being their author. In the New Testament, these letters are attributed to Paul. The 13 letters are divided into two sections. In the first section in the New Testament, we find the letters that Paul wrote to churches, to communities. And these letters are arranged in the New Testament simply they're ordered from longest to shortest. In the second section of letters written by St. Paul that we find in the New Testament are the letters not written to communities, but to individuals. And these letters also are arranged in length from longest to shortest. Now, the authorship of a number of St. Paul's letters is debated. Now, I acknowledge this topic, of course, can become sensitive and is a bit of a tricky topic. When we see a letter attributed to Paul in the New Testament, we of course just assume that Paul sat down and physically wrote the letter himself. Today, we understand authorship or the author of a letter to be the person who literally wrote or typed the letter. Anything else we would consider to be a forgery or perhaps dishonest. But we know that Paul does not actually literally write any of the letters that are attributed to him. Paul always used a scribe. We see this in Romans 16, 22. So at the most, Paul would have dictated most of his letters. Sometimes we read that Paul would write a short message in his own hand at the end of a letter to add to what the scribe had written. This is in 1 Corinthians 16, 21, for example. The use of a scribe, of course, was common in antiquity. Sometimes an individual would dictate what they wanted the scribe to write. This was the case for many of Paul's letters, their dictations. In other situations, however, someone would delegate the authority to a scribe who would then write the letter. The person, for example, would tell the scribe the main points they wanted to scribe to communicate in the letter, and they would leave it to the scribe to work out the details. In such a situation in antiquity, this person, who basically um, gives authority to the scribe to write, would still be considered the author of the letter. Things in antiquity get more complicated, however, because in antiquity, authorship could even have a broader connotation. Things get more complex when we consider that someone could still be considered the author of a letter, even after the person died. And this goes both in the New Testament and outside the New Testament. For example, if an individual were the spokesperson for Paul in a community when Paul was alive, and explain Paul's writings to the community, this person would continue to speak in Paul's name after his death. This person then could write a letter in the name of Paul, and it would not be considered dishonest or a forgery. <clears throat> this person truly bore Paul's authority. We find the same thing happened in other writings in the Greco-Roman world at the time. For example, the writings of Pythagoras. Pythagoras's followers wrote letters in his name after he died to continue to transmit his teaching. This phenomenon we call pseudepigraphy and is very different from a forgery, which is when someone exploits the name of a famous leader to bolster their authority or their work. This is something that's dishonest. The New Testament knows about forgeries and cautions against it, such as 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, cautions against forgeries. Now, scholars have long discussed whether all the 13 letters which bear Paul's name in the New Testament were written by him, and whether some of them might be pseudepigraphical and perhaps written after his death. Various criteria are used by scholars to argue for this, including language, changes of language and style, historical anachronisms and theological inconsistencies. Now among the 13 letters attributed to Paul in the New Testament, seven are considered to be undisputed letters of Paul. This means that there is no real debate that Paul actually wrote these letters. Well, technically dictated these letters to a scribe. Now, in, in the New Testament, the seven undisputed letters of Paul, those letters certainly written by him are Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. Now, the other six letters attributed to Paul in the New Testament are often called disputed or deuteropauline letters. Although these letters bear Paul's name, they are argued to be pseudepigraphical and written after Paul's death by people who thought they were qualified to address the church in Paul's name. These letters include Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. 
Now, depending on the letter, there is more debate surrounding the authorship. For example, in the case of Colossians, about as many scholars consider it to be written actually by Paul as those who do not. In the case of Ephesians, however, most scholars consider that it was written after the death of Paul. Now, again, this issue of authorship can be sensitive. You might be thinking, how can you possibly tell me that some letters that say they are written by Paul weren't actually written by him and maybe even written after his death? Ultimately, however, the issue becomes less controversial when we remember that authorship meant something different in antiquity than it does today. The importance of authorship or this discussion of authorship is important because it determines how we interpret a letter. It's not something simply um, kind of academic of no import. A scholar, a, a letter, for example, written during Paul's time would address a different time and situation than one written after his death. So as we go through these sessions, we'll discuss this further, this question of the dis undisputed letters of Paul versus the disputed or the Deuteropauline letters and what difference it makes. Now, throughout Paul's letters, we find a rich description of the gospel. Paul in his letters describe what the gospel is, that is, what God has done in and through Jesus, his life and his mission. To describe the gospel, Paul uses various images and themes drawn both from the Jewish scriptures and Greco-Roman cultures. Here we see that in describing the gospel, Paul again is being a bridge as diaspora Jews often were. Paul bridged the Jewish and Greco-Roman worlds. In his mission, Paul always wanted to speak to people in a way that they could readily understand and appreciate his message. Now, these are some of the rich ways that Paul describes what the gospel is, what Jesus has done for us, and we'll unpack these themes in later uh, sessions. Paul understands that what Jesus has done for us is justification. Jesus has made us in a right relationship with God. Paul sees that what Jesus has done is salvation. Through Jesus, we are rescued from evil. What Paul does for us is an act of reckon. What Jesus does for us, according to Paul, is an act of reconciliation. We are put in a right relationship with God and one another. Paul understands that Jesus has brought about expiation. He blots away our sins. Paul redeems us or Jesus redeems us according to Paul. This, of course, is terminology from the slave trade. Through Jesus Christ, Jesus has paid the price to liberate us from the slavery of sin and death. Jesus brings about freedom. We're set free from sin, law, and our selfish desires so we can live as God wants. Jesus sanctifies us. He makes us holy. Jesus transforms us. He allows us to change into the image of God. In Jesus, God works a new creation. We have a new life by participating in Christ's death and resurrection. In this, Paul rereads the creation account in Genesis and understands that those who are in Christ are part of a new creation that is in the process of being made. In Jesus, we are glorified. We share in God's glory. In Jesus, we are atoned. The sins against God require some atonement, and Jesus has atoned for these sins through the gift of his own blood. Now, what happens to Paul after his mission in the Aegean is unclear from his undisputed letters. Paul does hint of a westward journey to Spain in Romans chapter 15. Now, Acts of the Apostles picks up the story from the point where Paul's letters leave off. Acts of the Apostles explain that Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, then spends two years in Caesarea Maritima, which you can see on the map on the screen at the top of the screen. Paul from Caesarea Maritima travels to Rome by a perilous sea journey, and then Paul lived in Rome for two years preaching. This final journey of Paul is shown on the map, again on the screen. The Acts of the Apostles does not describe the death of Paul. In the Acts of the Apostles, Paul's life ends when he's preaching in prison in Rome. From early Christian writers, however, we learn more about the death of Paul or traditions about the death of Paul, which seem to have occurred in Rome. Eusebius, the church historian, tells us that Paul was executed under Nero in Rome during the persecution of Nero, while Tertullian relays the tradition that Paul was beheaded. Tradition has it that Paul was beheaded <clears throat> in the location of the current church called Tre Fontane, or the Church of the Three Fountains in Rome, 
you can see the bottom left of the screen a picture of the interior of this church on your screen. This church is really fascinating to visit. It has kind of a lot of traditions associated with it, kind of fun traditions. Inside this church, there are actually three fountains, each of which is found under an altar. Now, as the story goes, when Paul was beheaded, and you can see the pillar in the picture on which Paul was beheaded, his head came off and his head bounced three times. At the location of each of these bounces of his head, a fountain miraculously arose. Now, this story is probably apocryphal, meaning it probably didn't happen, but it's a story I really like because it shows this great power associated with Paul the Apostle, even at the moment of his death. And again, Tre Fontane, the Church of the Three Fountains in Rome, is a church that commemorates this event. Finally, of course, and this is where we return to the beginning of the talk, there is an ancient tradition that Paul's body was ultimately buried at the site of what is now the magnificent Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. This magnificent edifice, which I described in the beginning, located at the center of what was the Roman Gentile emperor, is certainly a fitting memorial to the great apostle Paul. Paul, of course, was this Jew called by Christ Jesus to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So it's fitting, really, that he was buried in Rome in the capital of this Gentile empire. So thank you all very much for listening to this session. Um, again, if you have any questions, we'll dig into them now. You may place them in the question and answer box. Just um, as a reminder, as these sessions go on, we'll have three more sessions in the course of the year where we'll really dig into more of Paul's writings, his texts. In our next session, which was entitled Paul Heals a Divided Community, we'll talk about how Paul sought to heal divisions in local churches. So we're going to explore in particular 1 Corinthians, where Paul aims at building unity among followers of Jesus. And I think that this guidance Paul gives is very relevant today as we seek to overcome divisions in our communities, whether they be in society, in families, or in the church. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to responding to your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you so much for um, your beautiful introduction to the life of St. Paul and the historical background of the time where he lived. So I'm just looking at uh, some of the questions, um, asking for the recording. Yes, there will be um, the, the, the session has been recorded, so we'll do a little bit of editing and send it out in the next week or so. So and it will be emailed to everyone who has registered. Uh, how old was Paul, Father, if we know when he was executed? Yeah, he was uh, around 60. So mm -hmm. Paul's life, it's kind of an easy way to consider his life. You break it into two periods of time. The first 30 years of his life, he was a Pharisee. And then around the age of 30, just shortly after Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection, Jesus, Paul had this great encounter. And then for another 30 years, he was this great missionary, uh, this apostle to the Gentiles. So more or less 60 or so. Uh, the dates are, again, a little uncertain. Uh, we try and glean what we can from his letters and Acts of the Apostles, but around 60 years old when he was executed. And a question that came also is, how did Paul hear about the stories of Jesus's life? How did he gain the knowledge of the man Jesus? Right. And I mean, that's a very great question and one that is, is really debated, right? Like, how much did Paul know about, say, for example, did he, did he know the traditions in the gospel? How much of Paul's teachings did he know? And it's, it's quite debated still, but it would seem that because Paul is persecuting the early Christians, Paul certainly would have heard about Jesus enough, like heard about his life and disapproved of, of the way he was being presented. So Paul learned before already um, uh, his conversion about the life of Jesus, his teachings. This is why he persecuted them. And ultimately then, after his conversion, Paul explicitly says that he learns about Jesus um, in Damascus and then also learns about um, Jesus from the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. So he continued to investigate who Jesus was after his conversion. Uh, another question is about uh, the timing of Paul's death and Peter's death. Who uh, died first? Around the same time. It's a really good question. Like they're both dying in Rome during Nero's persecution. Okay. So it's quite remarkable like that both those those fellows are in Rome doing their ministry and die at the same time. Mm -hmm. Quite incredible. Mm 
Yeah, I truly really appreciated also the many photos that you shared with us about the, the places where he's buried and also um, the beautiful churches. Yeah. And um, the term Yahweh, is it a Hebrew term or is it equivalent to Christ and Messiah? Yeah, I know. Good, good question. Um, Yahweh is, is the name then we find that God reveals to Moses, right? In the burning bush, it's used elsewhere. Uh, oftentimes it's, it's, we say Lord instead, because it's the sacred divine name of, of God, of the Lord of Israel, right? Of the God of Israel. Uh, so that, that was the name that God has in, in the old Testament that would be translated, uh, Dom Lord in, in the, in the Greek as well. Um, but Messiah was God's instrument of salvation. Messiah comes from Hebrew Mashiach, which means anointed one. So the anointed one in Latin Christus or, or Greek as well, the, the Christ, right? So uh, it, it's, whereas Yahweh is the name for God, Messiah or Christ is the name for God's chosen instrument, the one to bring about God's salvation. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Jesus, they kind of come together, right? Because Jesus is both as a Messiah who also shares in, in the very being of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Uh, can you explain a bit more about Paul as a Pharisee? For instance, they say, would he have worn the traditional clothing that we're familiar with through the images we see? Hmm. Would he have been also a teacher as the Pharisees or to the Pharisees that we read about in the Gospels? All, yeah, all great questions and um, a lot of speculation, but we can't know too much about that because we don't actually know very much about Pharisees in the first century in Palestine. And um, the school I went to, actually, they were having a whole symposium to try to study what was this movement of Pharisees in the first century. And as I mentioned, Paul is actually the only Pharisee uh, whose writings we have, right? So we, we don't know how Paul was dressing. It could be if he's following the law, okay, he's, he would have been dressing as is outlined there. But um, those certain details we're not aware of. Was Paul a teacher, a rabbi himself, even before his conversion? Again, could be, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. We can just gleam certain things from Paul's letters, Acts of the Apostles. Um, yeah, good questions. And Father, who did um, Paul's letter reach? Was it read by the Jewish, in mm -hmm. the Jewish temples, or in social gatherings, or in the marketplace, or was there... Uh -huh the newspaper of the day? How were they distributed and um, received? Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, letter writing, when a letter like this was sent, it's important to remember too that Paul sent it with somebody, right? And so Paul would send a letter with someone who would actually, and it would be read usually in the community, the ecclesia, the Christian community, maybe they're meeting in someone's house or, you know, in the context of liturgy. And it would be read by the person that Paul sent the letter with, who would like be the first person to preach about the letter, to explain it and answer questions. You know, when Paul sent his letter to Corinth, they might say, well, what does Paul mean by that? And the person who Paul sent with the letter would actually say, well, I was there when he wrote it. So like, this is what he means, right? So they would expose upon it. So that's in the first instance sent to Christian communities. However, very quickly, the communities that Paul started begin to exchange these letters, right? Because they see that this, these letters, you know, we received in Corinth, guys over there in Thessalonica, you might like this also. So we're going to send this to you. And letters of Paul begin to circulate among Pauline communities and get collected. And those letters of Paul, it seems, were collected already before other texts in the New Testament were collected into that canon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they were originally one, but then they became more widespread. Thank you. And why is St. Paul's Basilica called outside of the wall? Yeah, good question. There was... Um, you, you could not bury someone within the walls of Rome. So you, you had to have cemeteries outside the city walls. The city walls inside were for the living, right? And then outside the city walls, you buried the dead people. You're the cities of the dead, right? So both uh, Peter's tomb, which is in St. Peter's Basilica, and Paul's um, tomb in St. Paul's side of the walls would have been locations outside the city limits of Rome at that time. So Paul had to be buried outside the city walls as all people were buried outside the city walls, right? So, uh, yeah, so that's why, too, like the Vatican Hill was outside. It was across the Tiber, outside the confines of the Roman city. You buried the dead outside the city walls. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Father. And we read in the Gospels a few days ago that Jesus chose 72 disciples. Mm 
to proclaim his word. So it seems that Paul was a, an afterthought, one of our attendees says. Yeah, good. I mean, yeah, Paul and Paul has to like kind of um, struggle with that, right? Because he was not one of these initial disciples, right? Um, he was not one who was following Jesus during his life. You know, Paul didn't seem had maybe was not too aware of Jesus while he was alive. Paul comes afterwards, but he still wants to say, and that's in 1 Corinthians 15, look, I have just as much validity to be an apostle as anybody else who lived at that time. And that's very significant for us, right? Because even though we're living 2,000 years later, we too, like Paul, can have this experience of the risen Christ and be an apostle, be a missionary, just as Paul was. Uh, otherwise, like, after you, Jesus died, like, too bad. Do you know what I mean? But Paul is really this great example of someone coming after Jesus's passion, death, and resurrection, who still can have this same mission as those who were called by Jesus, like, during his earthly ministry. Yeah. And what did the apostles, the early apostles, that think about uh, Paul? Yeah, again, good question. We see that Paul goes to, to Jerusalem, right? To Paul wants to get validation, um, approval for his missionary um, strategy to the Gentiles. And we see that those pillars of the church, right? Uh, Peter, James, and John approve of it, at least according to Paul, they approve of it, right? They offer him the right hand of friendship. They say, you go, according to Paul, you go mission to be a missionary to the Gentiles. Peter will go to the Jews, right? But then we see also right after that, that Paul and Peter had some tension, right? Paul at one point in time calls out Peter to his face because Peter, even though agreeing that, okay, Gentiles to become part of God's people don't need to be circumcised, don't need to follow Jewish laws. Then Peter later on, after saying that to Paul, was kind of um, not following that in his own life. And Paul felt at ease to kind of confront Peter about it. So certainly they worked together. They had kind of saw themselves as having two different missions within overall Jesus's mission. Uh, so they were working together. They, they worked together, but there was some creative tensions, we could say, between them as well. That they, yeah, Paul would sometimes challenge Peter, at least on one occasion. Yeah. And um, was there a different status uh, between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians? Yeah, I, again, it seems like when Acts of the Apostles, for example, one of the reasons why the deacons are, are, are kind of initiated was because the Gentile Christians felt that their widows were being excluded, right? So it seems, unfortunately, like especially when you read Paul's letters, a lot of things are causing division, right? And so one aspect within early Christians, it could be that you have, yeah, you would have had different communities that are Greek speaking, Gentiles, right? And more um, Jewish, originally Jewish followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Excellent. This is a more practical question. So you mentioned Father uh, Paul's strategies. In today's secular world, how can we be such an effective um, evangelizer as Paul was? And so what could be our efforts um, in our local area? And how do we manage his strategies in our world today? Yeah, great question. And I mean, Paul is living in a secular world, right? Paul's world is like our world, you know? And so um, Paul, as I mentioned, was a diaspora Jew. So this means that he's bridging cultures, right? He's, he's, he's raised, steeped in the Jewish faith, but he is missionary, like he's active in a world that doesn't share that. So Paul, first of all, had a great, it's not like he hated the rest of the world. No way, right? Like he saw a lot of good that was there. He also saw the bad, right? But he would absorb and use different ideas like philosophy, like stoicism. So with us as well, we need to speak and explain Jesus in a way that people understand, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, um, kind of engaging with culture is important. We can't like just pull away and ignore that that's happening. Uh, that's one. And then another would be like, Paul met people where they were, right? Like Paul is going to urban centers. Paul didn't wait for people to come to him, you know? So Paul is going, I think that's another thing to go out. Like Pope Francis speaks constantly about going to the margins. Paul was doing that constantly, right? Paul also, and I think this is important for missionary strategy today, was a team player, right? Like, so we're not alone in this. We need each other. We need support. And also delegation. Paul was a great delegator. He didn't try and do everything himself. Like he delegates. Um, Paul is well in his life. His missionary output was motivated and formed by prayer, right? So 
we need that in our in our outreach as well. And Paul, I would say as well, had this focus on the poor. Also, we heard that when he's sent away, Peter says, but don't forget the poor. And then Paul says, well, that's the very thing I would never do, right? So also that that words, you know, have to be combined with action, care for the poor, right? And also this, you know, that Jesus Christ redeems us, meaning it's like that slave thinking from the Greco-Roman world. We're slave to sin and death. Jesus gives his life, but it's not like we're just live how we want. We now are a slave or servant of Jesus, meaning we have to live in the best possible way, right? So it, it, it's it's a message we proclaim, but also have to live. So action and words go hand in hand. And so, yeah, great question. Deserves a lot more kind of thought through, but those are just some things that come to mind. Thank you. And what are some of your thoughts of why God chose Paul as a disciple? Right. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's, you know, like it's this mystery that's there, but I, I was kind of hinting at it before that, you know, Paul is a model for others who come later, right? Because Paul was able to be an apostle without actually having been physically called by Jesus during an earthly ministry. So if the only people who could be apostles or we could say missionary disciples were those who knew Jesus during his earthly ministry, we'd be in big trouble. But Paul, and who, who really dominates so much of the New Testament, shows us that that's not the way it works. Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. He calls us, right? And so Paul is really a, a model for all of us who come after, you know, like those first 30 years of Jesus's life, you know? So he, he's just, I think, such a great example. And, and Paul was, you know, like I would assume most listening tonight here are not kind of coming from a Jewish background. We are Gentiles, right? And so Paul was the one who was kind of, you know, this is, we were the ones he was focused on, right? So. Uh, Wonderful. Maybe just a last word about why are the letters of St. Paul so important? Yeah. So the letters of St. Paul um, are the, for, for many reasons, right? They're the earliest writings we find about Jesus, right? So they, they predate the gospels and, and, you know, something that's, that's earlier that Paul's still working things out, but they're indispensable then sources for, for theology because of that. Um, and yeah, his, when you look, Paul wrote the most in the new Testament, mm -hmm. right? Like his writings, he, he has the largest corpus, right? So if you look at the new Testament and it's like a library, which authors are most important, well, the, someone who wrote the most in there, you got to focus on as well, right? So both because of the quality of his writings, you know, the um, amount of them and the age of them relative to other writings all make them central. And I would say for Catholics, often we focus on the Gospels perhaps more be, because um, we hear them at Mass always, right? But certainly for other Christians and Catholics as well, Paul is, is oftentimes more the focus. Hmm. As again, seen as that first Christian theologian, really. Very good. Well, we do look forward to hear uh, our next session on First Corinthians, if I remember. That's right. And of course, the uh, third and the fourth. So the next session will be in November. I think November 13th is our next day. So we're very grateful to Father Nick tonight and of course to all of you for attending our session and for really desiring to grow more in our knowledge of scriptures and how to use them in our prayer and how to allow scriptures to inform our day-to-day -day life. Uh, we learned a lot about the life of Christ and what he has taught to the apostles, so very valuable to all of us. Um, so we will see hopefully all of you next Friday, October 8th. We are continuing to celebrate the year of St. Joseph, and um, we will have a webinar on marriage and family through the eyes of St. Joseph. And this will be with the Powell family. So Brett Powell, that some of you know, the um, Archbishop's delegate and his wife, Andrea, and his son and his wife. So wonderful conversation between two different generations, um, mother and father, daughter and daughter-in-law discussing about marriage and family life through the eyes of St. Joseph. Um, on October 14th, we will also begin our next endowed faith study for women. And at this time, we will be studying the document Lumen Gentium, the light of the nation. This is a study that will delve into what the church herself has to say about her origins and structure, sacramental life, and her mission to make disciples. It's truly an invaluable resource to women who want to deepen their relationship with Christ.
as they expand their knowledge of his church. And lastly, just at the end of the month, our Archbishop, uh, Michael Miro, will be with us again for the Into the Deep session, a reflection on Amoris Laetitia. And again, a topic that will explore and celebrate the year of the family that we're celebrating today. So um, thank you again for being with us tonight. We hope to see you in the coming up weeks. And thank you to Father Nick again for his wonderful um, lecture tonight. And we look forward to the three more to come on uh, the Letters of St. Paul. So Father, may we please ask for your blessing as we enter into the night. Yes, certainly. And, and thank you all so much for joining us. And I hope to see you again soon, virtually like this. So the Lord be with you. Be Almighty God bless us all in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, sister. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Father. Good night.